This is the editing room of a scholar, a professor of philosophy. His name is Houston Smith. For six months, Dr. Smith has been doing research on a special project and recording his findings on film. His purpose has been more than usually serious and profound. He's made an attempt to discover America's own moral answers to 16 of the most basic public and private issues that Americans face. In his search, Dr. Smith has traveled thousands of miles and asked literally hundreds of questions. He's talked with scholars and statesmen, newspaper editors and economists, philosophers and politicians. Tonight, from these priceless film records of that journey, Dr. Smith has drawn together what he believes are America's best answers to another basic problem of our future. Tonight on The Search for America. I'm Houston Smith. The object of our search tonight is the United States and Russia. The question, what is or should be America's relationship to the Soviet Union? Politically speaking, the mid 20th century is characterized by two giants, the United States and Russia standing astride our world and reaching into outer space. To minimize the conflict between us would be absurd. At the same time, we know that if either party tries to end the dispute by a war, it will end the dispute only by finishing off the disputers as well. What then should be our relationship to the Soviet Union? Is it possible to do business with the Russians? Is it possible to coexist with them indefinitely? Is the Cold War likely to warm up or to cool off? The first man I wanted to put these questions to was Harold Stassen, because I knew that he had had a long career of actually negotiating with the Russians, first at the founding conference of the, San Francis of the United Nations at San Francisco, and more recently as special assistant on disarmament to the president. And so I drove to Philadelphia from New York, and after twisting through the narrow streets for a bit, I found the Ben Franklin Hotel a few blocks from Independence Hall. Several hours later, Mr. Stassen was able to take time from his campaign to talk with me. Mr. Stassen, you have negotiated with the Russians. Do you think that Russia has been changing since Stalin's death? Uh, since Stalin's death, there is a change. This reflects, I think, something even deeper than that, uh, deeper than the death of Stalin and the coming up of this uh, Khrushchev group. It reflects that education has reached millions of young Russians. Uh, these uh, boys and girls of Russia in the last 20 years have been educated as scientists and engineers and teachers and doctors and dentists and so forth. But you can't develop a mind in a specialty and keep it compartmentalized. And these young Russians now, by the millions in their 30s and 40s, they want peace. Uh, they want more contact with the rest of the world. They want more individual human rights and dignity within the Soviet system. And this is a pressure for change in the communist and socialist system, which is important for the future of mankind. Is this likely to continue so that we can look forward to a softening of the differences between their system and ours? That would be the hopeful approach, but always be wary that there may be uh, regression, there may be new repression. I think the odds are for an evolutionary change in the Russian system, in the direction of more freedom, and a better way of living with the rest of the world. Mr. Stassen, do you think that our policies towards Russia have been wrong in any significant ways? I think there have been some... Uh, Mistakes. What would these be? 
Well, there's been some tendency on the part of some to feel that you want to push in the maximum pressure against the Soviet situation and uh, apparently with a view that you have an internal cracking and deterioration and upheaval. Now, you cannot rule out the possibility of an upheaval inside, but I believe that in that process, you'd have the tragedy of a world war with all the devastation that a modern war would mean. So that I feel that American foreign policy should assist to the extent that it can consistently be done in an evolutionary change of the Soviet Union. But that's the avenue for peace and for a better outlook for mankind. Well, and this means a willingness to, to ease off tensions mutually, a willingness to carefully negotiate problems that uh, have mutually advantageous solutions. Your words clearly say to me that we should not be trying to make things just as hard as we can for the Russians. But do you think that there are any ways in which we could positively be working to encourage a wider distribution of power in Russia or movement towards an open society? Well, of course, the more open exchange, which yes, is beginning exchange. to increase, well. but uh, uh, which uh, needs a much wider expansion. Uh, we should be uh, looking for the avenues of wide visiting back and forth. Do you think that today we are actually any more open to Russian visitors than Russia is to American visitors? Well, as you know, uh, there have been periods of times when uh, we were being very technical and very slow in, in opening up, uh, even though our great tradition is to be an open and free country. Uh, we also are showing ourselves and have at various times to be uh, very, very uh, negative on the matter of exchanges of visits with the people of China. Uh, here again, some very difficult political situations. But to close people off one from the other should not be American policy. We, 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 if we hold true to the basic concepts of freedom and that peoples have uh, spiritual value, uh, then uh, we should be open toward other peoples, even though there are unresolved, deep differences of political systems. Well, Mr. Stassen, if we are able to avoid war and can have this kind of peaceful competition that you envision, what will happen? Well, I have a deep and abiding faith, uh, Mr. Smith, that the, the system of freedom will win through uh, over a long span of time. I believe that uh, man was meant to be free. In other words, the underlying philosophy on which this nation is founded is right. And this does not speak in terms of an American national victory. I do not think in that terms. But a very uh, good world situation in which Americans live if freedom is winning through in keeping with respect for the dignity of the human personality of all races and colors and creeds under God. From Philadelphia, we drove to Cambridge. I had heard on every side that uh, two of the best people that could be found on the subject of Russia were Mr. and Mrs. Rostow of MIT's Center for International Studies. MIT is an impressive, sunlit pile of granite sleeping on the banks of the Charles. As I made my way to the conference room, the great dangers of our time seemed scarcely real. In this setting, I wondered, would the Rostows be interesting but removed? I couldn't have been more wrong. What do you think the world is going to be like uh, around the turn of this century? If we could get some idea of that, maybe this could give us some guide in our present dealings with Russia. Well. What you can say, looking ahead, is that um, round about 2010, two great societies, uh, those of India and China, will have achieved industrial maturity. By that I mean their, uh, moment, they began to gather industrial momentum in the early 1950s. And the mysteries of compound interest and the passage of about three generations of men in a modern society 
if history is any guide, should decree this kind of a setting. There'll be two billion extra people in the world who have at their command all of the tricks of modern technology, industry, and science. Might, might the year 2000 come earlier? By this I mean, is it possible that history is, has been accelerated sufficiently, that the technological revolution has advanced far enough so that it won't take the same number of generations and the same time span in order to produce the situation that you're describing? Uh, it'd be uh, extremely pretentious and uh, quite silly to be dogmatic about my 60 years. Uh, but uh, if you look at the rates of investment which are going forward in India and China and compare those with the rates of investment in the United States and Germany when it industrialized Japan, they're about the same rates. They're about uh, between 10 and 15 percent of gross national product a year. And uh, so I have a hunch that maybe well, it'll be about 60 years, but it could be shorter. Of course it could be. As I hear you, at that time, we will probably not be the most powerful nation in the world. Certainly, we won't be the most populous. We may not be too far down the line, but at any rate, by the time we reach 2010, say, the bulk of the world's power is going to lie outside our shores. Is this true? I believe that to be true, yes. Yes. Now, what kind of a, of a, ninth, uh, of a 2010 would we want in that situation? What kind of a world would we want then? Well, I think we'd want these things. We'd want first uh, to have, uh, not uh, as a negotiating item, but to have in being, fully institutionalized, in full working order, a system of armaments control which would, in effect, uh, take the power out of power politics, at least take the military power out of power politics. And uh, I'd put uh, very high on the agenda between now and 2010, and as soon as possible, uh, the getting installed of that kind of a system, so that the, these new nations come into a world that has already built into it an effective uh, armaments control uh, system. But we want more than that. Uh, we have a great stake in these nations uh, coming into maturity out of a sequence in which uh, they are not necessarily democratic in our sense, that they don't repeat the story of the United States, but they have built modern industrial societies around their own version of uh, what you might call simply uh, humanistic principles. Why is this important? Well, it's important um, for two reasons to us. First, we're a society uh, which is going to be able to to develop along his historic, its own historic paths best if it's in a world environment of other open societies. That is, societies where uh, uh, there is a very wide measure of, of individual freedom and a high area of protection of the individual against the state. But that's not all. Uh, societies which are responsive to the, as it were, accumulated demands of, the, of its citizens on a roughly a, a one-man, one-vote basis, are less likely to be aggressive. So we have a double stake in the development of these modern but uh, humanistic societies, even though they draw their humanistic principles from their own cultures and own traditions and own history, not from ours. Well, let's come back to Russia. What does this long-range outlook say with regard to our relations with Russia? Well, Mr. Smith, I think it defines what our problem is in dealing with Russia. Uh, it defines the goal that we, we're after, and it defines uh, what stands in the way of our getting to that goal. Well, would you speak to each of these? What's the goal? Well, the goal is to persuade uh, those responsible for policy in the Soviet Union that they share our fundamental interest. Because the truth of the matter is, if the vision I've drawn is correct, that Russians and Americans, as people, uh, share uh, exactly this same interest in relation to the evolving new world. That is, they share an interest that their children and grandchildren grow up into a world where these vast new powers enter a system of orderly organization. Do you think anyone in Russia sees this common interest? Well, I think they're beginning to see parts of it, but they're not ready to act on it. And I think they're not ready to act on it 
because built into their relations with the Soviet peoples, built into their habits of mind, uh, built into the experiences of the men who run Russia, and they're men in their 60s, are the habits and thoughts of the concept of world domination. This doesn't mean, I think, that they've got a world plan, a, st a scheduled plan for taking over the world, but every move they now make um, is consistent with the, uh, the goal of moving uh, towards world domination. This is one of those occasions where I think you just have to believe what people say. They tell us that that's their goal, they act on it, and I think that's the way it is in their minds. So that our task is to persuade them to abandon this goal and to accept another. Now, how do you do that? Um, I think the f what we have to do on the outside is to persuade them that all the routes they now perceive and um, uh, routes on which they're spending a lot of resources and energy and talent uh, towards world domination are going to be blocked. Now, what are those routes? The first one is the most expensive and the least likely. It's that they get far enough ahead in the weapons race to make it rational for them to try to take out our retaliatory power at a blow. Now, um, this uh, is something, of course, that we, we, we must prevent. We must keep up our power to prevent further communist encroachment upon the world. What else do we need to do? Strangely enough, I think in Moscow, uh, that, form, that route to world domination, which they regard as most possible, is uh, the least expensive and the least military. In essence, what they're doing is uh, associating themselves with the existing non-communist nationalist regimes in ways that make them look to the uh, less well-informed people, the friends of nationalism, the friends of independence, the friends of economic growth. But uh, diverting that nationalism in ways that are going to slow down uh, economic development uh, and social development, and in the meanwhile, building up a communist, a local communist base on uh, this uh, proposition that only communists uh, have the uh, secret and only communist tricks of organization can take a society rapidly into modern economic and social status. What they're doing with Nasser, for example, is tempting him into all sorts of uh, uh, nationalist diversions. Meanwhile, the Communist Party of Egypt has been working uh, to undercut Nasser by telling the people, of course, uh, this man cannot deliver uh, in terms of economic and social progress. Well, this is where foreign aid comes in. The purpose of foreign aid is, uh, strangely enough, uh, not basically an economic in my view. It's certainly not uh, to outrace the Russians in some sort of a numbers racket with their economic assistance programs. The purpose of foreign aid is to offer a powerful and stable incentive to the politicians in the underdeveloped areas of the free world to focus the energies and talents and resources of those areas on the difficult but possible job of modernization. Because what the communists are counting on is frustration, frustration with economic and social progress. So that um, my conclusion uh, uh, is that uh, we must block uh, Soviet military strength at all its levels, large and small, um, and we must block that other route, uh, the route to power uh, via the frustration of the ambitions in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. And uh, I think with those three major routes to world domination blocked by our policies, both military and constructive, that uh, we might have the setting uh, to begin uh, more directly the job of persuasion. Well, these, as you say, are, have been blocking actions uh, to prevent the expansion of Russia's power. What should be our approach, Mrs. Rostow, to Russia itself? Mr. Smith, I'd, I'd start by saying that we should continue to do what I believe we have effectively done in the past, which is to hold open to Russia at all times a door to negotiations. It's important, for example, that we remain within the United Nations, that we leave always available that particular area within which a negotiation should take place, that we make it perfectly clear to the Russian people that ours is not a commitment to world domination, that our ultimate goal is not to dictate to Russia the precise terms of her future organization, but rather to give to the Russians 
for the first time in recent history, the opportunity of determining this for themselves. Mrs. Rostow, do you think that there's any likelihood that Russia will become a more open society than she has been since her revolution? This is really a question of, of whether or not we will get back to that old and rather abused phrase, uh, a self-determined world. If, if Russia were freely to choose her own form of society, I have considerable confidence that it would not be a police state. As long as the conditions for, for the maintenance of power of, of, of the communists remain in Russia, I don't see how you can, you can have much optimism for a complete reversal of the internal conditions. In other words, my, my answer, Mr. Smith, to the, to the question is that we can't, we can't afford to be too hopeful about Russia in the short run, but we have every reason to be hopeful about Russia in the long run if we meet some of the conditions. This will require that the Russian leaders alter their conception of their relation to other nations. Will it also require that they alter their relation to their own people? Well, in my view, uh, and this view is not necessarily shared by everyone, it's exactly this problem which now prevents us, in this generation of Russian leaders, from having an armaments control agreement. I think that in three ways, an armaments control agreement would alter the basic historic relation of communist Russians to the Russian peoples. First, uh, they would have to go to their peoples and say their security no longer depended upon their maintaining this garrison fortress against a hostile capitalist world, that their security depended on maintaining an agreement with the capitalist world. And this would profoundly undercut the whole domestic basis for a police state. Secondly, no matter how carefully you try to economize on inspection, and inspectors are going to be a nuisance, still any workable system that's going to cut down the risks of war is going to involve a lot of fellows wandering around your country pretty much with the freedom of bank inspectors. And well, this Khrushchev's image is more vivid. He said, we don't want to invite you into our kitchen. That's right. <laughs> and this, is a, this, is, and this, is a, this was a very honest, uh, compulsive statement of, yeah. uh, of Khrushchev's. Uh, uh, he said something the same thing. We don't, want to, we don't want to fly in your sky. We don't want you flying in our sky. But this goes to the very heart of the nature of a communist control over its citizenry, which depends on people not wandering without controls, without guides. Uh, throughout the society. They, th this is not an open society, no matter how many visitors go on the, the trek from Moscow to Leningrad to Samarkand and back. That's, that's rigged, that's fixed, and that they can control. But the third thing is this. You enter an arms control system and you cut down the military budget. Russia, historically, is now teetering on the age, if you like, of the Fliver, the Volkswagen. They're rich enough to afford suburban housing and mass automobiles and the gadgetry which obviously the Russian people yearn for. But you start that on the road uh, to uh, consumers' goods and services, and uh, I think the effects on communism as we've known it would be explosive. Be, um, simply because the central issues, uh, it would be an admittance that life no longer had to be austere, that the human ambitions for a more decent life were legitimate. So that I think that the real problem they face in accepting an armaments control system is of finding a new relationship to the Russian people. Mrs. Rostow, is there anything that we ought to be doing by way of providing an example of a free society for Russia to look at? You bet there is. I think that the, the hesitancy that we have in showing off our goods to the world is something that we might, we might change. It's all very well to be modest, but it would be, I think, a useful exercise for Americans to give the world a demonstration of, of self-confident democracy. For example, we should not be hesitant in allowing in students and visitors who have a reason to come to this country and letting them see exactly what America is, the bad with the good. We stand to lose nothing by this because I know of very few tourists to this country over time who have not emerged with a, an awed sense of the the complexity and, in a sense, the health of this society. Mr. Rostow, would you like to add anything on this question? My feeling about uh, this range of issues that we've talked about, long and short, is that Americans uh, who uh, are going to live and bear some responsibility as citizens over the next decade will be living in one of the most wonderful times uh, 
of any generation uh, of which I know, one of the most dangerous, and one of the most challenging, because it's some time in the next decade, in my view, that this arms race has got to be settled. I think either the world's going to blow itself up or it's going to figure a way to handle these things. If that's right, then this is the decade, this is the decade or so in which the Russians decide uh, that uh, uh, world domination's a, a hophead dream and that they're going to settle down as a nation. And it's in this decade that India and the race between India and China as examples for underdeveloped nations is going to come to crisis. Either the Indian second five-year plan is going to succeed uh, with our help and the help of the West or it's going to fail. If it succeeds, in my view, it's going to look better than the Chinese Communist Plan. And a vast change in the view of communism in the underdeveloped areas will occur. If it fails, the rather mediocre performance in communist China is going to look awfully good. So in these three great uh, areas, the next decade is going to see big answers emerge. Uh, how they emerge depends on whether this generation of Americans is willing to focus uh, not only its resources, and it'll take resources, but its best minds, its talents, its thoughts, and uh, its idealism on this range of problems. I don't know when I've felt an issue so well dealt with as Mr. Stassen and the Rostows dealt with this one. What should be our policy towards the Russians? Block their outreach towards world domination on three fronts. First, by keeping up our deterrent guard. Second, by developing a task force to keep them from chewing off nations through brush fire or guerrilla warfare. And third, by accenting our foreign aid program so as to give underdeveloped nations the strength to withstand communist infiltration. Meanwhile, we should be doing everything in our power, and this means more than we have been doing thus far, to bring nuclear weapons under control. If, in addition, we could provide a compelling vision to the rising generation of Russians as to the rewards of a truly free society, this too will help them to react, to relax their own way of life. Nothing, of course, to ensure success, but it does sound to me like the sanest approach to our foremost contemporary adversary. This is National Educational Television.